Today's special guest has worked with several space agencies. He's also written several books, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Rocket Boys, and he just released his latest book called Don't Blow Yourself Up. Join us today as we interview Homer Hickam, coming up next. Three, two, one. Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. Hello, thanks so much for joining me today. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce my special guest, Homer Hickam. Homer is the best-selling and award-winning author of many books, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Rocket Boys, which was adapted into the popular film and one of my favorite movies, October Sky. But Homer is much more than a rocket boy. He's been a writer since grade school, a Vietnam veteran, a former coal miner, a scuba instructor, an avid amateur paleontologist, and a retired engineer. Homer joins me today to discuss his latest book, Don't Blow Yourself Up, The Further True Adventures of the Amazing Rocket Boy. Your Space Journey. Hello, Homer. Hey, Hey, Jack. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I think I'm doing okay, (laughs) all things considered. (laughs) I actually want to share something with you. Okay. um, That I really got a kick out of this actually... Let's see if I can remember which screen this is. Um, this blew me away. Uh, we actually spoke, oh my gosh, like three and a half years ago. And you wrote me just this wonderful uh, thing on, on Twitter uh, after our interview. And I just wanted to thank you <laughs> face-to-face or face-to-Zoom because I cannot tell you how much that meant to me. I'm not, I'm not showing it to you to brag on it all because <laughs> honestly, it makes me nervous because I have a lot to live up to after that first interview. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was a great interview. What? Um, yeah, I remember that. Do you really? Online coffee break. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That was a good it was so much fun, and I've always been a huge fan, and I always love your books. And just for those of our audience out there, um, way back then, that was oh my gosh, like 2018, and it was even after that. But you wrote this wonderful book, <laughs> Carrying Albert Home. Uh, for those of you who don't right. know about it, it's a great tale of a young couple and their special pet. Uh, on a crazy thousand mile journey, which I still to this day laughed out loud as I was re- reading this. My wife said, shut up. I was like, this is so hilarious. So I love that book. <laughs> oh, and thank first, you. I love I loved writing that book. That was a book that was a lot of fun. The young couple happened to be my parents long before I was born and um, going down to Key West. And right after that book came out, I guess if, if that interview was in 2018, so that was very close to when our house got destroyed yeah. down in uh, St. John, the Virgin Islands, absolutely devastated by Hurricane Irma, which uh, there, there's a there's a 1935 hurricane in carrying Albert home. So uh, so I guess um, uh, absolutely. I, I enjoyed that interview. So I didn't have to think about rebuilding my house because we were right in the middle of that at the time. Yeah, I remember you did mention that in the interview and I'm so yeah. so sorry you went through that, but I, I trust everything's OK now. How's yeah, we it? built it back. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> well, good. Well, why don't we have you on today? It's to talk about this awesome new book, Don't Blow Yourself Up, which I'm happy to say I'm not too far into. I'm on part two now. So um, okay. I'm really, really enjoying it. I do want to wait before we talk about that because I'll, I'll give you plenty of time. Um, sure. But I do want to kind of step back in time to say October 1957. Oh, wonder why. Yeah. Wonder why. You're Something happened. This guy, you saw this little artificial satellite sputnik going across. Can you describe that moment and kind of how it in, influenced you? Well, yeah, I mean, the, the the Russians launched Sputnik. I like to say the Russians launched Sputnik in 1957, and right after that, the United States launched us. That is the students of uh, of the country yeah. um, because of that uh, that Sputnik moment. But um, yeah, I was um, I was kind of a lackadaisical student. I was 14 years old. I was in the 10th grade and um, didn't really know what I was going to do with my life. And then um, this Sputnik thing happened. And I'd read a lot of science fiction growing up. And it was like I, did, I never expected anything like that ha- to happen during my lifetime. 
Uh, well, maybe we might get something in the space, but uh, certainly um, nothing like uh, into orbit and scaring everybody like Sputnik did. And so um, all of a sudden, I just got fixated on the idea that I, I wanted to see this thing that everybody was talking about. We were living in this little uh, Colwood, West Virginia, little, little coal town. Um, and um, uh, so I told my mom that I was going to go watch. Uh, I, I read in the paper that Sputnik was going to fly, actually fly over Colwood. This was the, th the thing that everybody in the whole world was talking about, right? Yeah. But And nothing ever happened in our town that anybody would want to talk about. But uh, Sputnik was coming to Colwood. So uh, I told my mom I was going to go out in the backyard and watch Sputnik fly over that night. And she told the neighbor lady who told the neighbor lady and somewhere along the line uh, down the fence line there, I think the message got muddled and and the message was that you could only see Sputnik from our backyard. So um, so my poor dad came out in the backyard and there was all these people there and, and he goes, Elsie, why are all these people in our backyard? And they said, well, they're here to, to watch Sonny, as I was called back then, uh, uh, or help Sonny watch Sputnik fly over. And uh, dad said, oh, it, it, it won't happen. President Eisenhower would never allow that to happen. But it did. Ike was not in charge of, um, of uh, physics. And so um, sure enough, Sputnik showed up. And I'd never seen anything like it before. It was just uh, so bright and it was moving so steadily. You know, it was just unlike anything that I'd ever seen in the sky and like this the star and i was so impressed by that at that moment i decided that um i was going to figure out how to get in the space business so that's how that's the reason i started building rockets and that's why my mom told me don't blow yourself up which <laughs> See, I, I love that I love, and there's there, there might be a few few of our audience that actually maybe hadn't read the book rocket boys or seen the movie october sky a great movie on that um just the top level view of it. Can you give a, maybe just a, a 30 second, 45 second, what is Rocket Boys October Sky before we go into your new book? Yeah, um, well, you know, um, I, I'm always astonished when somebody is not familiar with, it, with the story or has seen the movie because uh, I think every substitute teacher in the world shows October Sky. <laughs> they well, they wheel, wheel that, you know, the little TV in, and there it is, because it, it'll fill up an hour and a half or so. Um, yeah, the story is that um, that this boy that I was, uh, 14-year-old little Sonny Hickam, uh, living in Colwood, West Virginia, got it in his head that he wanted to join, uh, be part of the space business. So the only way he could figure out how to do that was to build rockets. And um, his dad was the superintendent of the coal mine and that kind of make the mayor of the town. And uh, the idea of some boys building rockets in his town was nothing like nothing that he wanted to happen. But um, I gathered in five other boys. Uh, there were six, six of us, actually, including the prototypical nerd of all time, Quentin Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, who was uh, so full of brains. He said that he was uh, he couldn't do phys ed, physical education education because his brains were too heavy and you know he, he was something else so anyway I gathered these boys in we called ourselves the Big Creek Missile Agency and we started trying to figure out how to how to build and launch rockets and that was before you could order an Estes kit you know <laughs> so um, we ultimately became quite sophisticated in our, our our building and we had a lot of help from our science teacher uh, Miss Riley who got us a book called Principles of Guided Missile Design I later saw that same book in a PhD program for rocket scientists. It required a working knowledge of calculus and differential equa equations, and I was having trouble with algebra at the time. But I learned that I could learn if I really, really wanted to. And ultimately, we carried our designs off to the National Science Fair and uh, won the gold medal there uh, in 1960. So, um, and my you dad know, finally came say, around. And, and Homer, yeah. I hate to interrupt you, but I have to say this, because every, every time we say the National Science Fair in 1960, I have to point out, I am recording this from Indianapolis. And that's where oh, yeah. it took place. And I have to admit, I actually get upset when I hear that the, the story of the rocket nozzle getting stolen. Because I'm like, I know that happens everywhere, unfortunately, where you have misfortune incidents. But I, what I love, again, is the story of how your town came together and saved the bell, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, well, Chuck, I think I can let Indianapolis off the hook a little bit because there were people there from everywhere, all over yes, the country. Exactly. And uh, also, I was just I was just really dumb because I, uh, you know, I, I grew up in this town where there were, you know, you never locked the front door or anything like that. 
Um, we didn't even have locks on our lockers in high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, I noticed that everybody else was at night would put their stuff up. And I thought that was kind of silly because then you had to put it right back up again. And so yeah. I left my stuff <laughs> out sitting there and I, I always expected that eventually um, somebody would own up to taking those, uh, the yeah. nozzles. They took the, the rocket nozzles, but they never did. And, uh, but yeah, you're right. The town, um, they were having a, a, a strike in the coal mine at that time. And my poor dad, the superintendent, was trying to manage all that. And my mom comes to him and says, you got to help Sonny. He's, you know, you got to open up the machine shop. And that meant he had to work with the union. And so right. oh, he did. And um, uh, God bless him and got those rocket, got new rocket nozzles up to me in time to get judged. So that it, it's a story. And it's actually a true one. So <laughs> that's what uh, makes it amazing. more amazing. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the thing, the thing I love too, is, you know, the wonderful ending, you know, of, of, uh, rocket boys, October sky is, you know, you, you all got together, you launched the rocket for the last time. And what I love about your book, don't blow yourself up is it literally starts right where, right October there, sky rocket board ends. <laughs> and it's, it's kind of, I don't want to give you know too much away. Cause I want people to read the book. It's a great, great book, but it, it's not what you expect, <laughs> you know, as no, far I mean, as what happens afterwards. No, I mean, the, in the movie, I do have a, a little postscript in the book that, that tells a little bit about what actually happened to the boy, but it's real quick and it mostly focuses on working for NASA. And that's all the movie says is that, yeah. uh, oh, well, Homer Hickam went off to work for NASA and trained astronauts and then everything's wonderful and great. And here's the shuttle flying and yay, boom, you know. But uh, in fact, I didn't start work, working for NASA until I was 38 years old. So yeah, the book starts that very afternoon after all the big excitement and, uh, and and uh, the boy and his dad have had a moment, you know, with the arms around each other and it was all great. And then the boy comes back to his room and the other boys go somewhere else and he's sitting there and realizes he has no clue what he's going to do with the rest of his life. He's not even applied for college, which was the whole idea of building these things <laughs> in the first place. So, uh, yeah, it starts right there. And uh and it tells uh, how actually my mom uh, sent me off to Virginia Tech, which was a great engineering school, but also a military college. And yeah. I ended up uh, building this giant cannon down there called Tell Skipper. us about Skipper. Yeah, Skipper. <laughs> yeah, Skipper. You know, one of the reasons I, I haven't told Skipper stories, it's a lot, it's a lot like Rocket Boys in a way. Um, so we had, um, uh, Virginia tech was a, a pure military college. When, when I went there, it was called VPI yeah. and, uh, our big rivals was BMI. And we used to play them every Thanksgiving in football and they would march in their cadet corps and we'd march in theirs. And they had this little cannon, uh, called little John and they'd fire it and make a big deal. And they'd start chanting, where's your cannon? Where's your cannon? Which really irritated some of us over in the cadet corps. So, uh, uh, actually three cadets uh, got together and we decided we were going to build this big cannon but the administration was against it everybody was against it they told us no you can't do that you know blow yourself up you don't know what you're doing we did it anyway we built this giant brass cannon and uh in 1963 um well, we called it the skipper after JFK, who um, uh, President Kennedy, because he was skipper of the PT-109 during World War II, and he had recently been assassinated. But uh, we had the big game against VMI. They dragged out their little cannon, little John. They fired it, and they went, where's your cannon? Where's your cannon? And we dragged this great big thing out, and uh, I put in the biggest charge it ever had in it and uh, let it go. And uh, this thing weighs about 700 pounds. It lifted it right off the ground about an inch. Uh, shockwave flew across the, the field, hit the uh, VMI cadet corps, knocked their hats off, cracked the glass in the, in the press box in the other, other side. And there was a stunned silence for a little while. And then came our cadet corps saying, Here's our cannon. Here's our cannon. <laughs> Here's our cannon. And um, that, to, uh, to our uh, delight and surprise, I must say, uh, the Skipper cannon became an icon at Virginia Tech. It's, they're on their third one now, but the original one, the brass one, is in the Virginia Tech uh, Corps Cadets Museum. Oh, yeah. And there is a company of cadets 
that is required to keep it all polished up and they have a light on it. So it really is kind of like an icon. You go in there and you feel like that you're in some kind of church, you know? Oh my God. <laughs> no, that was a fun thing to do. And it's incredible. And again, you know, I guess that's a detrimental thing about podcasts is we took what was a great story. And I think there's three chapters that I was reading about the buildup of Skipper and, and everything that goes into it. And we've condensed it down. So I really, again, can't stress enough just how good of a writer you are and, and people you got to get out there and, and read this book. It's excellent. And then after that, just to kind of make it brief, it, it talks about college, but it talks about how you got into the army. Then it goes on to, I haven't gotten to this part yet, but how you served in Vietnam, became a scuba dri- diver instructor and so much more. Um, yeah, but I actually, interest- uh, actually yeah. did get, uh, you, of course, when my mom heard I was building that cannon at Virginia Tech, I got the don't blow yourself up um, thing. Yep. And uh, actually in Vietnam, I was blown up. And uh, so I got the, didn't I tell you not to blow yourself up <laughs> from my mom? So, so, yeah, I mean, that's been kind of a, 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 a quote from that originally came out of Rocket Boys that everybody kind of, kind of and, and logically and rightfully so identifies with me now. So I, I think it's, I think it's awesome. Now, obviously we, we love space here. So I do want to talk yeah, a little yeah, bit about, absolutely. tell tell us what you did with NASA. I know that didn't happen to your 38 and, but yeah. I'd love to hear about, and our audience would, what, what did you do for NASA? Well, I was all prepared. I mean, really, um, when I came back from Vietnam I, uh, and got out of the army, ultimately uh, Na- that was in the late uh, 1960s. And uh, <laughs> Uh, that's when the Apollo program was winding down. So they were, uh, NASA was laying engineers off. A lot of people don't remember that or realize that, but here in Huntsville, Alabama, um, where I live, it, it was almost turning into a ghost town because the Saturn was canceled, Apollo was canceled, and didn't know if the shuttle was going to be approved and all that. So I ended up going to work for the Army Missile Command, and uh, which is right here in Huntsville. And uh, so um, I had a really good career with them, still working with rockets a little bit, and um, ended up over in Germany. Um, where uh, NASA ended up hiring me, brought me back from Germany, and that was in 1981. And I came back and started working in the Space Lab program office. And uh, Space Lab is kind of an unsung hero of the space business. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but yeah, a, bit, sure. a lot of people uh, think it's Skylab. Skylab was our first space station, but Space Lab was a really, really cool um a module that fit in the back of the space shuttle. And it was built by the European Space Agency, but it was designed by us at NASA. And I was in that program office where, where it got designed. And so um, it flew um, for a week or two, however long the shuttle was up there. And you brought back all your experiments and you, you were able to swap them out. If they hadn't worked. You could tweak them a little bit and send them back up. You can't do that on the space station. Uh, not very well. Anyway, so... <laughs> So it, it was a series of, of wonderful flights, uh, but when we started launching it, we realized, well, we got to train the crews, uh, you know, for Space Lab. And I was a scuba instructor, and I was working in a neutral buoyancy simulator, and I, uh, I knew a lot of the astronauts already, so I raised my hand and said, I'd love to do that. So most of my career, I ended up uh, training astronauts um, uh, to either work on Space Lab or go up and uh, and work on a space uh, telescope. And so uh, the wonderful part of that was I got to go spend a couple of years over in Japan training the first Japanese astronauts, which was, um, that, that was incredible. It was an incredible experience, which you'll get to read about. Um, and then right after that, the Hubble went up and it, uh, you know, it turned out to be a little bit nearsighted. So I came back and just as I came back, then I got assigned to the Hubble Space Telescope Repair Mission. And that meant I got to wear the space suit, the EMU suit and go underwater and go through all the procedures on a one-to-one mock-up of the, of the Hubble. And, um, uh, uh, along with other other engineers and try to figure out how we were going to repair it. And then the astronauts came up, Story Musgrave and Kathy Thornton, uh, uh, you know, came up, changed everything. Of course, that's what they do. But that's all right. We got them started. And then I ended up um, after after that um, got assigned to the, this new International Space Station. And that meant I got to go over to Russia and um, start negotiating with the Russians. So I spent a lot of time over in Russia uh, negotiating with them, how we were gonna train their cosmonauts, how they were gonna train our astronauts and uh, drunk a lot of vodka. And um, is that when you got to kind of meet the twin of Sputnik? Is that what Yes, 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 yes. What was uh, that, that was like? cool. 
Uh, well, it was pretty amazing. So, so I'm there in Russia and, you know, we've already talked about little Sonny Hickam, 14 year old being just like amazed by seeing Sputnik fly over it. Like yeah. it changed his life, right? Uh, changed the whole trajectory of his life. Um, so, so, uh, so there I was in Moscow sitting across from the table, the table from the same guys who had launched Sputnik. They were still there. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> our, our, our engineers and scientists from Apollo and all that era were long gone, long retired, moved on, whatever. And there they sat, these old gentlemen, kind of dour, kind of unhappy. Wow. The Soviet Union had fallen. They didn't have any money. They were having to take our money. And, you know, and so they wouldn't agree to anything. They were just so grouchy about the whole thing. But then uh, after it, and you have to, when you negotiate with the Russians, you have to never expect them to agree to anything during a meeting. They just don't do that. Um, I learned different negotiating techniques with the Japanese, a totally different philosophy sure. there. Wow, they know you're jet lagged, so they try to get you on the second day, you know. <laughs> <It's a great laughs> sure, good idea. So, but anyway, um, the Russians, it's like, they're only going to agree if they make a personal connection with you. And that can only be at the party after. And there's a party after every meeting, doesn't matter vodka comes out. And so I, but I was totally impressed by them. And because these were the guys that launched Sputnik. And was, I started telling them about growing up in Coldwood and seeing Sputnik fly over and, and that how it, how it had, had changed my life and had changed so many other young lives in the United States. We'd actually become part of the space business because of what they had done. And, and they, apparently had never heard that they were just amazed that that had happened and i went yeah it did and so we got to be buddies you know uh, and they said would you like to see sputnik and i went yeah but i know it burned up about three months after it was launched they said no no we built two and <laughs> awesome so um so they took me to a location it was kind of indiana jones thing and um <laughs> they opened up a crate and they're set without the antenna or anything but they're set sputnik and it was just like the most amazing thing and I said, can I touch it, you know, and, and they allowed me to touch it. And it was, it, it, that's now in a museum somewhere. Uh, but um, that to me was, was amazing. And I made this kind of human connection with them right at that moment. And I thought it kind of put a bookend on my life in a way. So yeah. fortunately, I, uh, the good Lord has allowed me to go on anyway. So, <laughs> Oh, I, I think it's incredible. And again, I did skip ahead to read a little bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I was like, Oh, I've got to read this story. So that was neat. Um, now I know I appreciate you going over, over time a little bit for me. I want to kind of, Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I'm gonna, happy I, to say. Oh, good. Fine. I want, I want to ask you this. And, you know, there's, there's lots of momentum going on right now in the space industry. Oh, um, yeah. It's, lots it's of momentum. the golden age, really, of human space it, flight. It really know? is. I just yeah. want to ask you, if you were given the chance, would you go up? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm trying to be just as pleasant as I can be uh, anytime I'm talking about Elon or uh, or Mr. Bezos or, or Richard Branson. Um, I've known Elon for a long, long time. Uh, I actually met him really? after he sold PayPal. He came to adult space camp. And um, I was over there and that was after Rocket Boys in October Sky. And um, so I hung out with Elon for a whole day um, when because I'm on the board over there yeah. and I never expected him to do what he did. But I'm really, really proud and amazed at what he's done, uh, bringing uh, boosters back and and uh, using them over and over again. I, NASA would have never done that. We wouldn't have dared try because we would end up just blowing things up a lot. And, that you know, the federal government, the, the public that pays the taxes says, don't blow yourself up. So we try not to blow ourselves up, but Elon just went ahead. I loved it. He had kind of a rocket boys approach to everything, you know, skunk works. Um, you, you go ahead and you try things and it blows up. So you, you tweak it and you keep moving. Um, and so he's done wonderful. And then uh, Jeff Bezos said that October sky, he saw the movie October sky and that inspired him to start his, uh, his company. And um, I, you know, if there's any room on that new shepherd, I'd be happy to fill a seat. You know, if they need a little ballast, I'm, I'm right there for Mr. Bezos. And Richard Branson's kind of a neighbor. He's, uh, really? we have a home in, like we were talking about down the Virgin Islands. And I can't quite see it, although I try with my binoculars when it's really clear to see his island, because I know interesting things are happening over there. Yeah. But um, so we're kind of neighbors. So he should want to want to fly me. So absolutely, I would go in a heartbeat. 
Oh, I, I can see the hashtag now. Hashtag send Homer to space. <laughs> well, really? I mean, come on. I mean, isn't it obvious? I, I mean, would love to see that. Of course. Jake Gyllenhaal, Jake Gyllenhaal says right there in the movie, I want to go into space. He says it and he <laughs> and he 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 ends up training the astronauts, but he doesn't get to go. Now, I have to be careful with that because I'm afraid that that uh, Mr. Bezos will hear it and he'll decide to send Jake Gyllenhaal into space <laughs> and not me. But <laughs> You wrote the story. It was your story. Though. That's right. Thank you, Chuck. You're right. You got my vote, Homer, for sure. Uh, I, I just, uh, again, well, it's that counts a lot. That counts a whole lot right there. <laughs> I hope so. But I would, I would totally watch that. I think that's great. And Homer, I just want to thank you again for writing these awesome books. I mean, there's a whole bunch of series of books that are all available um, listening to your website, homerhickam.com. I want to encourage your audience to go check it out. And Homer, it's been a pleasure uh, seeing you face-to-face -face finally. And after you know three and a half years, always great talking to you. I just want to thank you so much for joining me. Well, same here, Chuck. And uh, I'm happy to come on anytime. So uh, I'm going to take you up on that. that after you, hopefully <laughs> the next time we talk, it'll be after your trip back from space. Hey, there you go. Now you're talking. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Homer, you have an awesome day. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chuck. Your space journey. Well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Homer. It was so good to reconnect with him after three and a half years. Uh, I especially enjoyed talking to him about his new book, Don't Blow Yourself Up. I highly encourage you to check that out. It is a fantastic read. It's available wherever you get your books. Also, if you want to learn more, just go to his website at homerhickam.com. I want to thank Homer for joining me today. I want to thank you for joining me as well. Again, we'd appreciate it if you'd share this episode with a friend. And if you're watching YouTube, if you can smash that like button, we'd like that too. Thank you so much for joining me. We'll see you next time. God bless.